these are not my wonderful cameras. Uh, we're going to let Michael share about that, but uh, I'm Nate Wolf. Uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you for those who are able to make it uh, for our next, our latest uh, Toledo area Biblical Cosmology Flat Earth Meetup. We had a few little adjustments this morning. Uh, we're in a little smaller room, but it's just cozier. And uh, we're live streaming. Uh, we advertised that we were going to live stream, especially for more so for Michael's uh, presentation. But uh, I just want to say welcome. Uh, most everybody here kind of knows each other. I know um, Roy came last time and met a good bit of the folks here, but we're excited to have Michael Solomon with us and Chris and Liz Bailey, as well as others, uh, some new folks that I just met uh, at Take On The World 19. So we're only about Three, Three weeks. weeks out. Yeah. Twenty-one days. Exactly. Wow. Isn't Twenty-one that days. Time flies. Time flies. <laughs> and you guys are still still smiling and still with us. So that's wonderful. Um, and they had an anniversary. And we had an anniversary. Yes. And this time you didn't Thanks. get frantic text messages from Bobby <laughs> Davidson saying, "Hey, hey, hey! Did you hear about that preacher guy, Nathan, that got fired? <laughs> Nathan, who? You know? Uh, it has been a surreal year. I'll just say that for sure." Mm -hmm. uh, my purpose of my presentation today is, is really not, it's not uh, something that I put together. I'm just gonna share from the heart. Uh, and then after my brief presentation, I'll turn it over to Michael Solomon, who's gonna give an awesome presentation, uh, especially for those who are wanting to learn more about photography and uh, probably work for any camera, but I know he's gonna highlight some things regarding the P900 and probably talk a little bit about the P1000, although we don't have one of those with us today. Bummer. The one we were hoping to borrow uh, is on the road or already in Tennessee, but that's okay. We'll make it happen. If anybody wants to send Michael a free P1000 with all the trimmings, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, but we do have a 900 here that for purposes of illustration we'll use. A uh, couple of quick announcements for those who are interested. They're still Time and tickets available for Flat Earth International Conference 19 in Dallas. That's November 14th and the 15th. And uh, that's going to be an amazing event. And I know uh, Rob Skiba is excited because that's literally almost in his backyard. It's like less than 20 minutes oh, nice. from where he lives. So he is very excited about this uh, venue in Dallas. I will be speaking out there about uh, biblical cosmology but also at the end of my presentation, I'll be sharing a little bit about why is it important to get to know the creator? Not just to know about the true creation, but uh, why is it important for us to seek and to have a relationship with the true creator of creation? So I'm very excited about that. Uh, at the end, for the folks that are here, I've got some uh, free stuff to pass out. I've got some of these great uh, pamphlets that were put together uh, by Nathan Thompson and others. Uh, one is the Bible teaches Flat Earth, and one is the original Flat Earth one. Uh, these are really great to pass out to folks. I've got some information on the Plain Truth documentary. Mm -hmm. I've got some of my business cards, which have all my new contacts. Welcome, Stephen. Good to see you, brother. See you. Uh, I also have uh, some cards from a friend. I'm going to highlight this real quick. Good thing I have arms like an orangutan. Uh, <laughs> Nathaniel of National Consensus Project. Some of you are aware of his work. He has a YouTube channel, National Consensus Project. He's the guy that a few months ago, I had him on my YouTube channel, interviewed him uh, because he had it on his heart to begin a ministry and a YouTube channel uh, relating to biblical cosmology. And, and his unique fashion, his purpose, at least in the first season that he did, which was about 10 videos, he made phone calls to different ministers, pastors, rabbis, Catholic priests, I mean, you name it, and uh, just random different folks in different states, and he would call them, and he engaged them in season one from Genesis chapter one, speaking about the firmament, and he would ask them the question, you know, what does this word firmament in Genesis chapter one mean? And some of you have seen his videos. Uh, if you're not already subscribed to his channel, please consider doing so. Uh, he's done some really great work, in my opinion, on that. Some of his uh, efforts have been very unique in the community at large. So support uh, Nathaniel on that. Also, uh, of course, I do have my book is out. It, it debuted at Take On The World 19. 
uh, with just a few days, like four or five days to spare. So I was really excited. Uh, paid a little extra on the shipping to make sure those books uh, weren't, you know, going uh, library rate. Uh, but this is available in a couple of different ways for those that may be interested. You can just email me directly, nate at firedfortruth.org. I'll send you a PayPal link. You tell me what kind of shipping you want, either media rate or first class, and I'll tell you how we can do that. You can go to my printer. The website is lulu.com, L-U-L-U.com. Just type in Fired for Truth in the search bar and it'll pop up my book page. You can choose your shipping there yourself. And what's wonderful about Lulu is that they do international shipping like a piece of cake. I've already had a couple of orders uh, from the UK and even one from the Netherlands. And I just got a, a email from the guy in the ne Netherlands the, yesterday. He said, hey, your book arrived. I'm so excited, thank you so much. So Lulu is a very good option, probably the best option for international. But also I'm excited about partnering with Zen Garcia's publishing group and uh, it's Justin Joy Garcia as well, Sacred Word Publishing. So you can find my book uh, at Sacred Word Publishing as well. And uh, sometimes they have uh, discounts and uh, different promo codes for folks that order regularly through them. So take your pick on that. Um, I do have a stack of books available here. If there's somebody uh, physically here that wants to purchase one, uh, be happy to sign that. Um, it just blows me away that people would want me to sign a book, but everybody <laughs> that's bought a book was like, you're going to sign it, right? And I'm like, sure. So that's kind of surreal, but I don't charge for signatures. <laughs> if you want a book with a what? signature, you can have it for free. Somebody was like, you need to charge for signatures. I'm, like, I'm never going to charge anybody for a signature from an ordinary man who's just trying to serve the, the father. So anyway, uh, this, this is something that I want to share with you all. Uh, as you know, it was, third, it was Friday morning, early Friday morning. It was about 3.30, 3.25 in the morning. I posted on Facebook an urgent request for prayer. Um, I had shared previously as well uh, that we had had some spiritual attacks um, about a week or so after I was fired. So this was the end of September in 2018. I had shared about a couple of strange uh, spiritual attacks that we had in our backyard. Both my wife and I had at separate times within the 24 hour period when we were praying against uh, Satan's attacks against the church because there were a lot of good folks at the church that had absolutely nothing to do with my firing. They had no <coughs> say in it. Um, and I knew that some people had already left the church, that there was some strife and some other things, some confusion. And I recognized immediately that that was from Satan. It wasn't from God. Uh, and it wasn't from the believers, true believers. So I shared about those experiences um, that involved uh, powerful wind, <laughs> uh, winds in our backyard. And, you know, I brought to mind the scripture about uh, Satan being the prince of the power of the air. That's a whole other story. I've told that before. But then a few months ago, as uh, my buddy and brother Daryl Lee, D.R. Lee, uh, we traveled to Indiana uh, to uh, Messiah's New Life Tabernacle for a men's retreat. And I knew that there was something special and important about this retreat. I had that similar nudging like Jennifer and I had about taking on the world. I didn't know what that would mean, but I said, hey, would you like to go? And you know DR, man, he's, he's game for whatever. Let's just pick up and go. So we went and uh, <laughs> that first night that we were there, I had woke up in the middle of the night at exactly 3 a.m. I, I swiveled out of bed and I looked at the clock and it was exactly 3 a.m. I was feeling flushed. I had like flu and fever-like symptoms that just came on immediately. But I also was experiencing this heaviness. It felt like this pressure, this weight pushing down on me and uh, just kind of almost a, a little bit of a sense of like dread or evil. I knew right away when I looked at the clock, <laughs> I said, okay, this is a spiritual attack. I don't know why I'm feeling physically sick, but whatever is causing me to feel physically sick is actually spiritual in nature. And so I began to pray. And after about 20 minutes, um, that attack lifted. And I was exhausted, but I went back to sleep. We had a great weekend and, and had a lot of revelations and game-changing uh, situations that happened that weekend. I've shared about that on my YouTube channel if you want to uh, 
uh, watch some of those videos from Take on the World uh, about uh, journey to whole Bible belief or journey to the Father's truth. You can check that out. But most recently, uh, it was Friday night, and I didn't check the clock at first. But looking back, I'm pretty certain it was right at almost exactly at 3 a.m. Because I woke up, I felt much the same way. My head, my neck, the back of my neck was very flushed and hot. I felt nauseous, and it was so bad that the, the entire time that this attack took place, it was probably a good 45 minutes, would you say, Jennifer? Um, but about the first 20 minutes, I also felt like I was literally on the edge of passing out. Have you ever felt like so sick or just so, so much uh, spiritual heaviness that it made you nauseous and you, you virtually felt like at any moment you could literally pass out? So I got a cold washcloth and, and I was praying and about 20 minutes into this, I realized that I needed to wake Jennifer up. Like I didn't want to disturb her, but I was like, I need some backup here. So I woke Jennifer up and uh, once she kind of cleared the, the cobwebs there, she, she said, well, let's pray. And so she began praying for me and uh, I was trying to be very focused and uh, I asked her, could you read some scripture? So she began reading from the Psalms especially and uh, about 10 or 15 minutes, I, I kind of felt like I'd get a little better. And then right as I was thinking, I would tell Jennifer, hey, I'm starting to feel a little better. The heaviness is leaving. It, it seemed to almost come back. And so it was about 325 or so in the morning. I got on Facebook and I asked friends on Facebook. It was kind of just, hey, I'm ha I need some urgent prayer. You know, I'm under some kind of strong spiritual attack. And once you know, most truthers are either night owls or insomniacs. So there was about eight or ten people, including Allison and a few others, that at almost four in the morning chimed in and said they were praying for me. And I really feel that uh, within 10 or 15 minutes of having many other believers praying for me, that the heaviness finally lifted. The nausea subsided. The feeling of, I'm going to pass out at any moment. Uh, just disappeared and again I was tired went to bed now I always say this because I want to make the disclaimer I am NOT a superstitious person but as I've said before in my videos when I have shared about these attacks I do believe in the supernatural I do believe what Ephesians 6 tells us about the spiritual forces of wickedness in high or heavenly places and I do understand that Satan is our adversary and he is our accuser and that he has uh, demonic and evil forces that work with him and work against the saints. And so, in some ways, this is a, it's a challenging situation. In other, in other ways, I'm almost somewhat embarrassed that for 20-something years I was in ministry, and yet apparently, although I do believe I was bringing forth a lot of good fruit, and good fruit in the Word, and good fruit in the congregation, I apparently wasn't... Uh, dangerous enough to warrant these kind of attacks. I mean, we had different occasions where we felt maybe Satan was attacking us or trying to discourage us, but this year, since my firing and since taking a public stand and being very assertive and upfront about my beliefs, these things have happened. And I know that coming off the heels of Take on the World 19 was a very, it was a very encouraging time for probably almost everybody that was there, but personally for me, and for my family, I can tell you, it was, it was a time of healing. It was a time of, hey, we're approaching this one year mark since our firing. It was one year since we prayed that, uh, that prayer at the conference about, okay, Father, do you need us to do something with this? And if so, please show us. We don't know. We don't want to make a move without you showing us the way. Well, he made a, he made a pretty fast move by allowing uh, me to get fired in such a quick fashion. But that opened doors to begin ministry right away. And so with these spiritual attacks, it's not that I'm fearful, but I am a lot more aware that of the fact that when you truly stand up for truth and you are in the trenches, Satan is going to take notice of it. And if, and if you are uh, effective, and, and by effective I mean if you're in the Father's will and you're praying fervently and you're teaching from the Word, you will be effective because you will be sharing with others, you'll be encouraging them, you'll be challenging them in a positive way, engaging in scripture, and that is going to be a threat to the powers of deception, the powers of darkness. So we have to be prepared. I want to share uh, one scripture with you regarding uh, 
the most recent attack. Uh, and, you know, again, this happened, this most recent attack happened, technically it was early Friday morning, the 13th, <laughs> with a full moon on the horizon. And uh, so it was a lot of strange things kind of culminating. But I know there were a lot of friends on social media that were posting on the same day. And even earlier that day, Ian Chadrick had a very strong spiritual attack against him almost the entire day. And if you know Ian, he's a very upbeat guy, but he's like, I don't know what it was. I felt pressure. I felt depressed. I felt anxious. He's like, that's not me. He's like, that's normally not me. So there were many other people this weekend, for whatever reason, felt these attacks. And uh, of course, Saturday, the very next day, was what? Yesterday was our one year to the calendar day anniversary of when I got fired. In 2018, it was Friday the 14th. This time it was Saturday the 14th. But somebody, I can't remember if it was, Al Allison sent me some prayers through email, and then somebody else recommended Psalm 92. So I wanna just read uh, Psalm 92 as I kind of close my little presentation here today, and then we'll open it up for Michael to jump in here. But Psalm 92 was very helpful to me, uh, the night of the attack, but also just reflecting on it this past week. Uh, let's see here. It says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in mourning and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with solemn sound, for thou, Lord, have made, have made me glad through thy works. I will triumph in the works of thy hand. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. Now we understand that to be a rhinoceros, okay? They call it a unicorn in King James. <coughs> I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eyes also shall see my desire on my enemies. Mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Uh, so that was very encouraging. And, uh, you know, also Psalm 91, I guess we have time. So I want to read this as well. It says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. <laughs> I had some terror by night. That is the worst terror I've ever felt. Nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that uh, walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand by my right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh to thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under thy feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. 
With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So those were two uh, psalms that people sent me through emails and Facebook Messenger, and it was uh, very encouraging to me. And uh, you know how Facebook does this weird thing where they throw your posts out of whack and out of time frame. So people since that time up to this morning have been coming on and saying, oh, I just saw this post. I know it's after the fact, but I'm praying for you. Um, so that was very encouraging to, for not just having that support during the attack, but the last several days and all through this anniversary date that we had yesterday, people were praying for our family which and for me, which was very encouraging. And so lastly, I'll just share before Michael gives his uh, presentation, we had we decided as a family, the Wolf Pack, as everybody now knows the family, but the Wolf Pack decided, hey, on the 14th, we are not going to get together and sulk and be sad <laughs> and frustrated <laughs> and mad about September 14th when I got fired, but we are going to, we're going to acknowledge, you know, the trauma and the emotional strain and, and the frustration and the anger that we had, but we're going to focus on the joy that we have, the things that we never expected to experience this year, the new uh, friendships, the support, uh, the amazing things that the Father in Heaven has done uh, for our family, with my ministry, uh, things like the fact that uh, less than a month or so after I got fired, an entire studio package showed up in five boxes on the front door of our house, and mm -hmm. that opened an opportunity for me to, to really begin an actual studio, to be able to share these uh, videos and uh, many other things, the financial support that has come always at just the right moment uh, to help us pay our bills and to have funds to be able to use for ministry. And I do want to let folks know that uh, some of the funds that are donated, uh, we will often use uh, for other people who have need. Uh, a lot of times you'll see fundraisers and different things on Facebook, and we try to, to help others as well uh, as we have that ability to do so. And so we are thankful uh, as a family for all the wonderful things that we've seen happen. And although it's hard to imagine that a whole year has gone by, uh, we know that in year two, uh, Father willing, more good things will happen, more fruit. And it seems like this last month has been uh, a huge increase in opportunities that I've had to, to give testimony, to, to give glory to the Most High, to minister one-on-one -on -one with various individuals in the truth community. Um, I already have some ideas on maybe my second book. I'm praying about that. But as Robbie Davidson said, hey, don't worry about your second book <laughs> right now. He's like, you just finished your first book. Then just enjoy that. Be happy about that. And, you know, get the word out on that testimony. And the second book will come. So I'll have to put uh, pressure on Robbie then to, uh, to write his second book as well. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I thank you for the time. Uh, I hope that the folks that are joining us uh, via the stream are blessed. Thank you all for the encouragement. I'm going to sit down and shut up and let Michael Solomon give his presentation. Hey, can we hold on? Let, yeah. me, let me get, yeah, get this. Yeah. I want to go over to our different page for this. Uh-oh, now things are getting serious. Well, I want to go, <laughs> go over to our flat out insights. There you go. Yeah. That I seems appropriate. Yes. And then I'm going to share. Yeah, I'll do this from here. And I'll share it all over. That's one of those codes down to me. You want to give him a good intro when we start so it looks like an official video? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Michael, you tell me when and I'll give you the official. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Hold on, hold on, one second, one second. Um, this is, um, uh, give me one second, I just got to get the title on here. I'm, ex this I'm excited slash always to have the Cleveland folks this uh, and the Michiganders. Flash. We actually have quite a few Cleveland area folks that have been able to make it and some new folks the last few months, so that's been awesome. Uh, otherwise, it'd be a pretty small group today, so mm -hmm. thank you so much. And we got some Toledo folks representing as well. Mm -hmm. You ready? Not, uh, Flat Earth Photography oh, yeah, Essentials. Yeah. Photography Essentials. Now, I will say this about Michael. He is very talented at what he does. He has decades of experience. Not that he's old, but that he has a lot of experience. Uh, and 
DR Lee and myself were privileged uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, right after Take On the World mm -hmm. 19, to have Michael come to our home. And uh, he actually gave us a private lesson there, mm -hmm. Daryl and myself oh, and Maria. Okay. And uh, it was Thank really cool. Suffer. It was really cool because he, he gave this presentation, I'm okay. assuming similar. Oh, it's probably brief part of it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he gave us the full books. <coughs> And he made us, he, he had textbooks for us and all kinds of stuff. And we spent a couple hours uh, sitting at his feet showing us uh, the ropes okay. and some, some wonderful cheat cards uh, and memory Sorry. cards that he gave us for photography. And uh, then when it got dark, what did we do? We went about a mile down the road. There's a little walk path that's in this open area of, of the marsh near our home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there aren't very many trees and we got out there with Daryl's uh, P1000 and my P900 and uh, we were able to shoot. Uh, we, we did have some clouds and, and chemtrails and different things that mm -hmm. kind of obstructed our view. Mm -hmm. But over the course of, I don't know, an hour and a half, we were there a while. We were able to catch several different stars up close uh, we were able to catch Jupiter and yeah. even the moons of Jupiter, uh, at least three of those we were able to see, mm -hmm. which was pretty fascinating. We all got mosquito bites pretty bad, I think. <laughs> it was rough. Uh, and we even got a, a prank call from a close friend in the middle of that, which I was, I was texting back and forth. <laughs> Who is this? Uh, why, why'd you get this number? But uh, all in good fun. But we really, uh, he put us through the paces because he taught us in the classroom and then he said, okay, now we're gonna go out in the field. And so I've learned a lot. And uh, right. you've seen, I was, yeah, I'm, I'm a complete noob, mm -hmm. beginner. And I was able to capture a pretty fantastic picture of Saturn, mm -hmm. which I don't know why it was a blue view. <clears throat> I don't know if it had something to do with clouds and whatever else, but I didn't use any special filters. I just used the basic settings that Michael uh, showed me how to do, but that's exciting that I can just, take out my P900, pop it on the stand, and right from my driveway, literally I just walked out of the front of my house, yeah. plopped it in my driveway and took pictures of Saturn, Jupiter, videos of the moons. Uh, it's amazing, it's exciting. Uh, so we're gonna turn it over to Michael Solomon who also is known for uh, the YouTube channel with Chris, Flat Out Insights. So many of you watching have probably seen their videos. This live stream will eventually, in a few days, be saved and we will upload it to both my channel, Fire for Truth, and Flat Out Insights. Flat Out Insights yeah. So that will be available to watch again if you like or share that with others. So, Michael Sullivan. Okay, <laughs> thank you everyone. Um, good to be back from Take On The World. And yes, Woo! I wish we were still there. <laughs> it was awesome. So it took me a couple of days to recover and I completely lost my voice. Yeah. I had to learn to speak so you can't lose your voice. Because I'm always, ah, you know. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to do something that I've been meaning to do and people have asked me to do and that I do professionally, but I, I haven't done it. And that is um, photography education. Teach people how to use the cameras that they have. Because in this movement, we all want to record the world that actually exists. Um, we criticize a lot, like I've been online, oh, your pictures are blurry, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I wanted to clear up some things and just go through some basic photography um, knowledge so that everyone will know how to use their camera. I teach photography a lot. Um, I don't do it full time but I've done it quite a bit over the years and I've developed a way to teach advanced and beginning simultaneously um, because I don't have a lot of time to teach. And I, the youngest I've taught are um, little 10 and 11 year olds from the Dominican Republic and I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> so, so I tried to use Google and it was a source of amusement for them because you know Google Translate puts weird words in there. And, but it turned out well, these, these kids never even touch the camera because you know nowadays kids think a phone is a camera. Mm. They've never even seen a flash before. So, and they took amazing photographs. So I want to kind of translate that up to here. Now, one of the questions is why don't I have a P1000? Um, because, uh, all my resources are tied up in this, all right? <laughs> I do, uh, my, my wife and I have a Bible study tool called Canon Quest 
all originally illustrated. Um, I can hand, hand these out and we do trading cards, activity books, posters, and now a game. And uh, so all of our resources are tied into that, but believe me, I can't wait till I get it. Um, so I'm calling this Photography Essentials. This is the first time it's premiering here. Um, I'm only going to do a, a certain part of this because it's larger, but it's, I'm, I'm doing this to show people how to actually use their, their, their camera, all these buttons and switches, okay? So how do you create this stuff? All right, so these are photographs, most of them from, from my portfolio. Uh, this, this one here and this one here is not from my portfolio, that's stock, because uh, I don't have a shot like those yet. But this is all from my portfolio. So how do you shoot pictures like this and also the pictures that, that, that you guys really want to know about, and that's stars, the moon, and curvature, curvature truths, and that sort of thing. Um, in other words, how do you shoot predictably? So when you hit that shutter release, you know that picture, you know how it's going to look even before it registers on your processor. So one way to do that is with, we're, we're, we're going to learn how to use f-stops, shutter speed, ISO, focus, lenses, and editing. And all of this equates to, oh, let me see. Yeah. Okay. Um, all, all of this equates to, oh, it's not there. <laughs> okay, control. All right. So control, I, I had a big word control in my voice. <laughs> control like that, but it didn't work out. But all of this equates to control. But I'm going to focus on just these two guys, not that. Uh, that's, yeah, there we go. There we go. It was in the wrong place. But, um, <laughs> but I'm going to focus on these two guys because control is everything. Because if you learn how to control these, all right, then these machines will, will do wonders. And f-stops and shutter speed and all those other assets of photography is how you achieve control. So these two guys work together, okay? Um, now, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, come on. Okay. Maybe I didn't save this when I. I've done that before. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start out with these are reference cards. Okay. For those of you that, that have used photography before in the past, you remember these. Okay. Some of these are really simple. Some of them are pretty complex. Like this one here, give you a headache. Um, <laughs> And uh, I love reference cards because I use them a lot when I first started. So what, what I did was design my own, all right? So I simplified it and everything you need is right there, okay? And so what I did was I created my own reference cards. And these are tear-proof, waterproof, uh, wrinkle proof and even gloss proof um, and my wife and I went through a lot to, to design these so that you can just take them out of your camera bag and use them um, you can pass these around to get a closer look at them um, so you have the basic stuff here and and then on on the front here um, your apertures shutter speed ISO and how they work all right, so once I explain it a little, then you'll go, oh, look at that. And all of this works together, okay? And, and once you learn that, that's the hardest part, then you will start to create predictively. Now, if you notice, I haven't even mentioned composition and stuff like that yet, because that comes alongside all of this, okay? We'll focus on that, but not so much, because composition and everything, you know, we'll focus on the rule of thirds and, and stuff like that. But, but that's really here and here. This stuff you really have to learn so you're not stuck using program and automatic modes all the time. All right, because then that means a guy in Japan is telling you what your photographs look like. You don't want that. Okay, so this is all the stuff here on the back, crucial terms that, that, that you need to know. 
okay? Now, the question is, all this fancy dandy stuff, can you use that on your camera? All right, so I have here just an example of, you know, the old fashioned, big, honking professional. And then this one here is great for photojournalism and stuff like that, with a short zoom. This is real long, um, low light zoom. And then you have this camera, it's like 10 years old. This is one of the first bridge cameras. Um, so it has everything all built in. And of course, you know the P900. Um, so what here does not belong, all right? This was my mother-in-law's. So you got this little guy here. Do you even sell these anymore? Um, so yeah, this. <clears throat> and then you have the phone, all right? So what does not belong on this table? These two guys, okay? With everything here, you will be able to control all these switches and the main menu and all that stuff. The camera talks to you. You need to know its language. And the stuff on this card will teach you that. You cannot get control with these, okay? And it doesn't matter how much they put in these phones. You cannot, these phones are not gonna beat this or this, okay? This is called a bridge camera. This camera is this camera all in one package. Is that why it's called a bridge camera? Yes, because they bridge them. So basically, this camera is a bridge between this and this, so you get this. All right. So that's like the Swiss Army knife you came with? Pretty much, yeah. I'm glad I got one. <laughs> yeah, 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 pretty much. In my opinion, in my humble opinion, I'd love to know what these guys think in the back, but in my hum hum humble opinion, photography for the masses is going this route. Okay, for the masses. Now, the pros aren't going to end this. I wouldn't. <laughs> they're, they're wonderful. Um, but the masses are going to go bridge, and believe it or not, Phone. Why? Convenience rules. Okay? But this is convenience and quality and control all in one package. Whereas this is convenience and you get some quality. Okay? So these two are going to rule eventually. Um, okay. So, all right. So we're going to focus on apertures. What does aperture do? Okay? Um, it's, it's, it's the uh, diaphragm within your camera that controls the amount of light that hits your sensor. It controls the amount of light. It also <laughs> controls depth of field. And I'm going to show you what that is. Okay, so you have this shot here. I just took that yesterday with the P900. So when people say, oh, the P900 can't give you sharp images, yeah, okay. So, so this was shot. This shot can be shot with a 2.8, f4, or 5.6, all right? This aperture setting will give you a picture like this. So if you focus on him, then the background will, be, will have that much blur, all right? So these apertures will give you that. You know, I've actually had, had some, some, some people say, okay, so what's the best exposure? No, you know, there is no best exposure. It depends on the environment you're shooting, and also the environment is what's in that viewfinder. So if you turn the picture a little bit this way, then you just change your environment, okay? So that's what the environment is. The environment isn't where your body is, it's what the camera sees, okay? So 2.8, f4, 5.6, let's go back to this here. So right here, you see the wider the aperture, the shallow depth of field, meaning, okay, if I focused on the bear, the background is going to be blurred, and the foreground. Whatever you focus on is going to be sharp, but at 1.4, f2, 2.8, you're going to have a very soft background. That's what blurry is, okay? And it's silly I didn't say that, but that's blurry, okay? Because people keep, I've been going through a tussle online, and people say, they don't know what blurry is. So, um, <laughs> so, but as the aperture gets smaller, you get increased depth of field, meaning the area, the field of focus gets larger. When you have a wider aperture, the field of focus gets smaller. So, so you have 
at F32, you rarely see that aperture anymore, but at F32, you get really, really sharp, okay? Foreground and background, all right? That's called depth of field, and that term is pretty explanatory, depth of field. So that's, so here, I wanted to focus on the singer and not on the environment, okay? On the isolated. Now this one, you can capture with these apertures, especially F8, because you see here, the, the focus is this young lady, and then as you get deeper into the photo, it, it, gets, it loses its depth of field until these guys are almost unrecognizable, cool. all right? So that's depth of field. This is a good depth of field here, okay? Um, a good example. This is another one that's actually the same event. So you see a different um, plane of focus. Plane of focus is what you're focusing on. So, so if you focus on this camera here, if you focus on this camera, then the plane of focus is parallel to your sensor. So the plane of focus is going to be right here. So anything behind this and anything in front of it is, your, is your, where your depth of field is going to be. Your camera can only focus on one thing at a time, just like your eye. Now here's an interesting thing about your eye, which is pretty fascinating. If you look at all around the room or even use your peripheral vision, everything looks completely sharp, doesn't it, at all times. You never see this with your eye because the eye focuses so fast, you don't see this. Your eye can only focus on one thing at a time, but it focuses so fast, everything looks like it's a deep depth of field all the time. That's amazing. They've been trying to copy that for years, and nah, nah, they haven't gotten it. It's not going to happen, uh, but that's some serious technology. Um, so, so with this guy, he's in sharp focus, and then the plane of focus is kind of at an angle here. Um, actually, the plane of focus is, yeah, about right there, and you see him. So you can capture that with those apertures. So you can predict what's going to happen in the shot. You may not want everything in sharp focus all the time. All right, with, with this one, you have F8, F11, F16. That is not as overexposed as it looks here. But this, you can see with, with these guys, now you're starting to see the background is almost completely sharp. But these guys are, all right? So you get deep depth of field. You see what I'm saying? So now with this one, this is one of my favorite wedding shots. It's like the only wedding shot I ever show because it's fun. Um, these guys were hilarious. We did all the traditional shots. I always have to, I have to explain it because people say, what kind of wedding was that? Um, it's, uh, they did all the traditional stuff. And I said, hey, you know, you guys, everyone looks serious. And so everyone looks serious. And they look like a mob family. <laughs> so it's, it's just great. Um, but with this shot, as you can see, all these guys are in sharp focus, including the trees in the background, including that lumber right there, the grass there. Um, uh, so you can get that with these apertures here in, in various degrees. Now, aperture is also affected by focal length. We're not going to talk about that today. All right. So basically, you can get this shot, but if you use a certain lens, it will probably affect, no, it will affect these apertures, okay? Um, so we'll have to talk about that on, on another class. Now this one, again, you got the tap dancer shoes all the way up, down, you see the seats there, everything's in total sharp focus, so you're looking at 16, F22, F32, okay? You get that deep sharpness there, all right? Okay, so let's talk about shutter speeds. Shutter speeds are the time the light is on the sensor, okay? So f-stop is how much light is on the sensor and it controls depth of field. Shutter speed is the amount of light, um, I mean the, the, um, the amount of time the light stays on the sensor and shutter speed controls motion. It freezes motion or emphasizes motion. Okay, so you have here, it's in fractions, and uh, oh, and the f-stops, that's like a German math thing, don't even 
ask. Um, uh, but it, it, I don't even know if I even remember. But but it's that's but it's just called f stops now. Shutter speeds are measured in um, uh, fractions because it's talking about um, <clears throat> this is one one thousandth one one thousandth of a second. A mouthful one twenty fifth of a second one. Um, one one twenty oh, yeah one one twenty fifth of a second. So it's all measured in fractions of seconds, and you can go on to minutes. You know you get really long exposures. So as you can see, the faster your shutter speed, you freeze motion, and then it goes all the way to the slower you blur motion. All right, it's that simple because the shutter stays open longer, and as the action's going along, you're going to get a blur. Make sense? Okay, so that's what, it's, and then vice versa with the fast shutter speed, you know, um, and it's fast too. It's amazing you can even get a lot of these shutter speeds with even mechanical shutters, which is really interesting, back in the old days of film. So with this one here, I use a fast shutter speed, okay, so to freeze all the drops, to freeze this guy jumping up in the air and all of that, so that's a fast shutter speed. Um, the, the reason why it's a silhouette, that's a metering thing. So we're gonna go over that uh, in the days forward. But that's a whole metering thing. We need to talk about light meter. Um, and this one here is 1 500th, 1 250th, 1 1 125th. And so you got her frozen, but you got a little bit of blur on her hands. Okay, she's really moving, all right? So, but I was able to freeze the dress because the dress is gonna move as fast as her hand. So, got a little bit of motion, but froze that dress. That was a fun shoot. So, this one, okay, so this one was shot with a slow shutter speed. That's why all of this is blurred. And the reason why he's sharp is because I was following him mm -hmm. during the slow shutter speed. So, I took the picture and I just kept moving. And even when the camera finished with the picture, he would follow through. Just keep going for a fraction of a second. But so while I was moving but following him on the merry-go-round, he's sharp, but the background's blurred. And that's how you get shots like that. Now I could have done that in Photoshop, but it's more fun to actually do it in this, you know, in the camera. That's control. Okay. Um, I actually did that on purpose. <laughs> so um, these guys, uh, this is a uh, track shot and you can basically do this with the same thing. Um, but what, what happened, the person just followed this a little bit, because you see some detail here, but there, you see some sharpness, but the legs are really moving, so you're gonna get that blur, okay? With 160th, 130th, 1, 115. And the only reason I give a range here, because it depends on how fast they're moving, all right? Because you can get motion blur even with 160th, okay? On, on, with some shutter speeds, doesn't matter how fast you're moving, it's gonna freeze it solid. Like a one one thousandth of a second or even faster than that, one eight thousandth of a second. It's gonna freeze it no matter what, all right? It doesn't matter how fast you're moving. Um, this one was fun, I'd love to get a shot like this, but I don't have one yet, so I'll use some stock. So this person's standing completely still, and you know how fast trains move, and you can use a really slow shutter speed to get that blur, okay? As long as you don't move, he'll stay nice and sharp. Okay, so, so you saw, and if you don't have any questions, just jump in there. So that's what shutter speeds do, that's what apertures do, and they work together. If you change your shutter speed, you have to change your aperture as well. All right, yes? Yeah, like, okay, so what you're saying then is like, <clears throat> how would you, let's say you're taking a picture of a highway at night, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of traffic, but it's not congested, it's flowing good. And they and you see these pictures when they take them, and the tail lights are stretched out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you achieve that? What's what's the shutter speed you would use for that? You, you would use a slow shutter speed, so I would use like a, a 30th of it. it. Depends on how much blur you want. 30th of a second, I'll start there. 15th, eighth. Okay. Um, it depends on how much blur you want, which is great. You can literally control how those streets <clears throat> look. Right. Then when you incorporate a flash into it you can get crisp sharpness and total blur, all right? So you use your flash with a slow shutter speed. Right. But yeah, you use a slow shutter speed, that's how they get that. 
just have it on a tripod and let it go. Um, it's, it's easier than, than, than most people think. But if you increase your shutter speed, you have to decrease your aperture and then vice versa. You can't change one without changing the other. Unless you, you know, doing something special, that's different. Um, I tell my students, break the rules once you know them. All right? <laughs> so, so once you learn fluently how these work, break them all day long. Okay, because the whole point, you learn this to break them. Okay, so, so macro photography, which is a personal favorite of, of a Maria, uh, magnify small objects used to shoot images very close. Okay, so you have this tree in my backyard. So, uh, uh, oh, I meant to put the exposure, I forgot to put exposure up, up in here, but I use. Uh, um, a short telephoto. This is all on the P900. I use a short telephoto on that, then zoomed in, and then I use the macro setting of the P900 to get that. Okay, now we're getting more camera specific. So, but, but, what I'm showing you here works on any camera that will give you control. Any camera that has these, this is more obvious, that have these dials on it. Okay, that will give you aperture, shutter speed, ISO, control. All of this works on those cameras, okay? Um, or else you just get what the camera gives you. So, so that's macro. So the macro setting on the P900 and the P1000 is excellent. All right, so you can get really, really close. Because if you notice how close I could get, all right? And so then... The setting for that is on the back of the camera, you have this dial here, and it actually has a little flower, and the P1000 is the same way. You have a little flower, and then you have, uh, and then you select the desired focus mode and press OK. And so you would <clears throat> scroll down here to, to macro and press OK, and now you'll be able to focus in close. Most cameras actually achieve macro similar to that. And some some cameras, um, the macro is in the lens, not in the body. Like these cameras, the macro is in the lens, okay, not in the body. Uh, the the um, bridge cameras, the macro is actually in the uh, body control because the lens is connected permanently. Um, okay, telephoto compression, space between objects appear to uh, reduce making distant objects seem closer. Wide angle distortion image appears curved due to lens shape. Now, I gave these terms in normal English language so that people can grasp them and use them. Um, you can get far more complicated, okay? But I tried to, and Maria helped me with that, because she's like, I have no idea what you just said. I said, okay. <laughs> so, so she helped me. <laughs> Uh, normalize it. Um, and if you notice, the colors are based on the sections. All of this is all lens stuff. And this is the type of lens magnification. And then it's all uh, uh, aperture, depth of field, shutter speed. That's all works together. Um, and then this is exposure. So, all right. So this I shot with a 2,000 millimeter lens. This is a, a faux pod that flat earthers do. They shoot a, a, a scene like this, okay? Oh, and look at the waves. You see how they look really choppy? Nope, that's because you're using a telephoto lens and it compresses perspective. They're no more choppier than this, okay? But they look like they're like, da, 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 you know, but they really aren't, all right? So this, I stopped at 50 millimeters. And honest, because if you notice, you don't see the bolt, it's gone, all right? That's another bolt. But the bolt I was aiming at is gone. It's beyond the curve, all right? <laughs> so so when, you, when you do a horizon <coughs> test, stop at 50 millimeters. And the reason for that is a 50 millimeter lens shows, it is, is uh, very similar to the proportions that your eye sees. So you want this to be an honest test. Most people go way out to wide angle. Uh, P900 will go to 24 millimeter. Uh, wide angle lenses tend to make things in the scene 
look smaller. They shrink things to get more things in the picture, all right? That makes the test not so honest because you want to go by what your eye sees. That's the whole point. You can't see that far with your naked eye. So stop at 50 millimeters. And the way to do that is you go into your menu. There's a menu button on the back of your camera. Yep, right there, a menu button. And you go in your menu and you go to zoom memory. Okay, so you go here. I have mine set on aperture priority. We're gonna deal with those later. But at this setting here, you go to zoom memory and it was off. Now that's on, okay? And then you set it at 50. So you know you're getting 50, okay? The thing about the P900 is it doesn't tell you what focal length you're using in the viewfinder unless you have it set at this mode. The P1000 does. That's why I said it's more refined. Everything's more refined. Every button, every switch is just a better camera. But we can talk about that. So, so then you have it set at 50 millimeter, okay? Um, okay, so just remember, when you do a test like this, whether it's over water, over land, you're trying to show that there's no curvature, stop at 50 millimeter. No matter what camera you're using, stop at 50, okay, when you're zooming back in. All right, so, okay, white balance. Adjust camera color recording uh, for the light and the scene. All right, you're setting your camera up for, for the light that's, that's in the scene. This is fluorescent. It's going to have kind of bluish slash greenish. Depends on what type of fluorescent. Um, daylight is, is, is more, it's a white light, okay? Um, tungsten light is a yellowish gold light. Uh, you want to set your camera up based on the light that's in your scene. All right, um, I have not white balanced stars yet, <coughs> so I'm going to do that. That's kind of interesting. So just to show you here, so this is off color. This is tungsten light. Everything in the scene is tungsten. Okay, that's another thing when people say, "Oh, the sun is reflecting the moon," um, is, is reflecting off the moon. Then that means the moon should have sunlight reflecting off of it. Just like this bear has tungsten light. The walls have tungsten light. How do I know that? because they're the same color as the tungsten light. Duh, okay? <laughs> so it's not hard, all right? So then when you white balance it, that's what you get. You get what your eye sees. So I had a little sound there because I was actually clicking and I was using this camera here and I clicked it, okay? And now you see what your eye sees because your eye white balances really well, all right? Um, and so now, it's white balanced, okay? So if this bear was emitting light or whatever and he was a different type of light, then the white balance wouldn't have quite worked for him because he would be a different light, okay? So uh, when you're white balancing the moon, okay? And that's wrong, oh man, because I had the moon, like the uh, harvest moon on there and then I white balanced it, so it didn't work. Um, just when I thought I was getting PowerPoint. So, <laughs> so you, you have a white balance, I'm a better animator. So, so you have white balance, okay? Um, you go into your menus and, and you can get to your white balance menu. Also, um, the P900 and other cameras have a fast function button. It's an FN and you can get to your white balance via that button as well. Um, but I just use main menu because it's easier to shoot with my phone. Um, so then I chose the K, which, which, which gives you uh, the Kelvin because it's, it's uh, uh, measured in Kelvins. So, so I chose that because it's going to give me the exact or, or really close to what color the moon is, what white balance the moon is. This is the, this is the sun. That's what white balance the moon is. If the moon is a different color temperature than the sun, then that means it's not reflecting the sun. It's just not. Because that's the only way it works. If it's a different color balance, I mean, if it's a different a color temperature, it is a different type of light. Just like 
this is different from a tungsten light, it's different from sunlight, okay, different from halogen light. It goes the same way here. Why is this any different? All right? So this should be the same color temperature or similar to the sun. Now, of course, the luminance will be different because it's reflecting in quotes, but the <coughs> color temperature should be the same, relatively the same. So, let's see, what am I doing here? What's this? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, Nate, you're gonna love this. Okay, good. okay. <laughs> so, focusing. Manual focusing on the P900 is a pain. When you <coughs> do manual focus on the P900, your default is to spin that little teeny wheel. And you gotta keep spinning and spinning. Yeah, when you got big fat hands like this, you're just like, yeah, you're like, nah, 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 nah. you wanna call your little niece to come and use your pinky or whatever. Um, <laughs> so you're spinning and spinning and spinning. So I said, this, 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 this can't be it. So then I did a little research because I'm, I'm really busy. And so then I, I said, you know, I'm gonna have to figure this out because this camera is so cool. This can't be the only way. So that's usually what you do. But guess what? You can use your zoom switch to manual focus, which is a lot easier. So you take this switch and you just flick it and it goes in and out of focus. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's going to just change everything. Um, so the way you do that is you go here in your main menu and you go to the wrench here, which is basically camera preferences, and you go to assign zoom control. All right. And then you can assign its default is this is just another zoom control because this actually zooms in much slower, okay, and it's really smooth. So opposed to your primary zoom control on your shutter release. So we need to go through camera parts too. Yeah, when um, you're, Michael, as you saw, when you're trying to focus in on stars and, you know, the quote planets or whatever, the wandering stars, mm -hmm. uh, and you're using the top, the top menu, it's real jerky, you know, because it's like you have to yeah. adjust the focus and all of that. But that that side uh, focus is much smoother, mm. and it, and you don't lose you don't lose your object as easily. No, no, you don't. And um, what I'm doing now is I compose on the star and I move the camera once I anticipate where the star is going to be and let the star move into the field instead of trying to stay on it. Okay. Um, Oh, you don't hold the camera like that. You hold it like that. <laughs> okay, that's, that is not good. Um, you cradle the camera. So uh, <clears throat> when you're focusing on it and you're spinning this command wheel, by the time you focused on it, because it's really slow, and by the time you focused on it, it's moved out of your frame. When you're using an extreme telephoto, it's at a very small angle. And so it's not a lot of room for it to move. And so it can go from here to here really fast. But if you use this, okay, um, if you assign this zoom switch to focus, it focuses fast, really fast. So that, that helps. Now, of course, with these babies, you know, just man manual focus is like this. You just set it to manual focus and, you know, it's old school. Now, with the P1000, the P1000 actually uses a big, fat, gnarly ring in the front. And you focus like that. All right, so it's really fast. Um, okay, so oh, okay. So I went through that a lot faster than I thought. Um, is what, what you don't want to do is go through this stuff fast. The best way to really learn it is to do it. Okay, f-stops and shutter speeds work together. That's one of the main things you have to remember. Uh, so, so you want to learn it control it, and then you can create predictively. And that's the main thing, it's all about control. And I know a lot of people when you're shooting and it, you have to feel it in your heart and stuff. Yeah, you do, okay? You I mean, you, you feel what you're shooting. But if you can't control this machine, it's gonna give you all kinds of results and it's just a luck of the draw. You don't want that. You don't wanna shoot 20 pictures and hope you get two out. I remember when I first started, when I got three good pictures out of a whole roll of 36, I was doing good, you know? And then as I got older and, and, and got more into it, 
I got to the point where I could predict what a picture was going to look like when using film. Now, of course, in the digital world, you have instant replay, or you have instant feedback, so you know what your picture is going to look like. In the film world, you had to wait, <laughs> unless you use Polaroid testing. That's a whole, that's a history lesson there. Um, so, so when you use those basic that basic knowledge, this becomes you. You get to the point where you don't use it anymore. Okay, and you pass it on to someone who, who can. Um, that's one of the reasons why I made it like this too, because you know, last forever, you give it to someone who's learning. But you you want to get to the point where this is obsolete. Then you know, yeah, okay, that's your graduation right there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> nice. So, any questions? Are you selling those cards? Yes, I am. Um, I'm selling them for eight dollars. And like I said, waterproof, wrinkle-proof, tear-proof, kid-proof. Um, Dog-proof? Hmm? Dog-proof. I don't know about that. Um, but, <laughs> teeth, you know. Um, but uh, they're, they're, they're pretty sturdy. That's another thing I like about it, too. Usually I used the laminated ones back in the day, and they lasted for a couple of months until they got dog-eared and kind of wrinkly and stuff because you put them in and out, in and out. Well, this baby's not, that's not going to happen. Okay? So... Um, so I spent a lot of time refining this and trying to simplify it. At first I just had the front and they were glossy. I said, that's not going to work. So <coughs> we, we found a laminate that, that has no gloss to it. So, and then I put the stuff on the back and that one's yours. Yay. So, because DR Lee hired me to do the class and so I got a new and improved version nice. of this. So you can toss the one you have. All right. Uh, <laughs> yes. So how does photography prove where we are at? Because it records what's actually there. Now the question is, how do you compare that to what modern science does? And that's not hard actually, because the one thing about these cameras is they're honest. They're just cameras. They don't have anything inside of them that's going to record some images not there. Um, also, you're going to recite what you see, and these cameras are honest in that regard. The P900 uh, is a 2,000 millimeter lens, but it's 2,000 millimeter optical. What that means is it's 2,000 millimeters of glass, okay? Like, like for instance, um, um, this is all glass, okay? There's no digital zoom or anything on, on this. This is pretty old school. So this is all glass. So this is only a 200 millimeter, believe it or not. Um, so, but this is all, uh, oh no, I pushed that button. I hit that button. I was, I was transmitting images over, over the internet by mistake. Um, so this is all optical. Yeah, this is all optical here. For some reason it's not coming up. Okay. Oh, right. Um, when you see right now, it's just coming out in steps because I set it so that it only zooms out at specific focal length increments. And which is really handy when you're trying to record what you're doing because it will actually tell you what focal length you're at. Like right now I'm at 1,000, 1,200, 1400, 1600, 1800, 2000. It's telling you in the viewfinder. Yep. Yep. Nice. So you can set it to do that. The P1000 is, that's unnecessary because it will tell you all the time. So, um, did I answer your question? Yeah. What's some examples of, um, do you have any, any, anything? Um, you, you shot some great footage, those videos on like the, the focal length of on the Take on the World channel. Oh yeah, um, let's see. Let's let's go there. Uh, let me find where is my focus. Right. Okay. Like, what's the difference between the pictures we see of planets, per se, and what they actually look like? The pictures of planets are illustrations. I know because I'm an illustrator. 
um, they draw them one way or another. Or sometimes they'll take a close up of a rusty bucket or something, and then and then prop it in a circle, and you hit and yourself with a planet. Hmm? And call it Uranus. Yeah, yeah. Mars. They're the, joking. The bottom part yes. of a rusty uh, cast iron skillet. I right. right. It was pretty when convincing. Propane. It was. <laughs> propane tank. When I was a kid, I used to draw planets because I was the original yeah. space cadet, and I used to draw planets, and I would do exactly that. I would copy off of a rust and stuff, and I would just do a squiggly line, squiggly line, squiggly line, and put a circle around it. Okay? Planet. Um, the difference with this is when we point at the planets, you know, they'll say, well, you're not using enough focal length. Okay, now, this camera, to buy a telescope to match this is gonna cost you a lot of money, all right? Telescopes are measured in inches. This is a, a measured in focal lengths. Um, <coughs> the equivalent to a P1000, I think it's 120 inches, okay? That's the size of an observatory telescope. Okay, so I know you guys are gonna try to get me on that, <laughs> all right? So, but if you do the conversion, so, <laughs> so. Michael, when we were taking photos and videos of the stars, you were saying how you know, one interesting thing that you discovered is that when you're moving from star to star to star, you're not having, in other words, they're all on the same. They're all on the same plane. plane. Remember when I said, if you're shooting this camera, everything here and here is gonna be a perfectly sharp focus, okay? Because it's all on the same plane. When you shoot stars, if you focus on one star and then you move your camera and focus on another star, I mean, and move your camera to another star, that other star is in sharp focus. Be and the only way that happens is when they're on the same plane. That's it. You mean they're not trillions of light years they're apart? apart. Yeah. No, because if that were true, then right. it, when you focus on this star and you focus on this star, this star will be blurry. Right. Trillions to trillions. And so what you're saying blurry. is when the Bible says that God created the sun, moon, and stars and put them, set them in the firmament, that they are all in the same relative plane. Yep, they're on the same plane. Isn't there an affinity setting on those? Yes, now here's something interesting. Affinity is when you're shooting stuff so far away, the camera can't focus that far, like this lens will focus 30 feet. And then after that, it's on infinity. So that's when you shoot mountains and buildings really far away. And everything's in focus in infinity. All right, now here's the interesting part. When you're focusing on a star, and I tried it, I went straight to infinity, the star was blurry. I had to pull back from infinity. I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Which means the star is closer than they say. Much, yes, <clears throat> much, much closer. Um, Which means they're always closer than they say because you can move from one to another and it's, they're in focus. Yep, yes. Now couldn't they say though that, well maybe that other star because it's bigger, so the distance would be okay because it's bigger, so they look the same. How do you? Size is irrelevant when it comes to depth of field. Okay. Totally irrelevant. If I take a picture of this and there's Tower City or some huge skyscraper in the background, it's significantly bigger than this camera, but it's still gonna be blurry as what? Well if I use 1.2 or 2.8, which means it's a very wide, sorry, card here, which is a very wide aperture. Okay, so it doesn't matter what size it is. And in and, 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 and the world of modern science, size means everything. Size, distance, um, wait, what, what do I usually say? Size, distance, and I say it all the time. Help me out, guys. Size, distance, and time. Um, thank you. Size, distance, and time. All right, that changes everything. No, it doesn't, okay? With depth of feel, it doesn't matter, that's a great question. It doesn't matter how big something is in the background or foreground. If you're using a small aperture, it's going to be blurry, okay? But they say trillions of miles makes a difference. When something is trillions of miles, even parallax doesn't work. You know when you're driving on the road and, and you see a fence is going, all right? And the trees are further away from the fence and the trees going fast, but not as fast as the fence. And then the houses, a mile away are going really slow in relation 
to your speed, right? That's called parallax. What they're saying is <clears throat> trillions of miles is so far away, you can't see the parallax. No, that's not how it works. And they can't prove it because you can't prove trillions of miles. There's no experiment, there's no practical experiment to prove that. So and the, to and the, you know, science tells us that the closest star is like four trillion light years. Light years, and one light year is, what is it? It's six, seven, it's, it's 600 billion miles? Yeah, it's like 700 or 600 billion 600 miles. billion, one light year, <laughs> okay? So, I mean, first of all, they can't see that far. I'm sorry, just can't. I mean, I did that video where I showed, um, I showed myself, I mean, I, they're talking about we, we have perpetual eyes, we can see, we, we have supervision, right? <laughs> so we can literally see back in time. That's, that's what they're telling us, okay? Um, hold on a second, I had this video where I don't know about you, but I can't see a license plate two houses down from me. But I'm supposed mm -hmm. to see trillions of miles. Mm -hmm. So I've learned that you have to actually show this. So let's see, with terrestrial? Yeah. Okay, so this this is fun to do, and my neighbors are looking at we're, it. We're into the bonus footage now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm hoping my phone's battery does not die. This, my, one, this one's going soon, yeah. <laughs> my uh, neighbors were really looking at me when I was doing this one. Uh, what is he doing? Uh, I don't think they're used to me yet. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So, was that from that mafia picture? <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so I, I printed a license plate just to show, because people want to see it, right? So I walk down to one house, that's one house, all right, you can still read it, right? Okay, no. two houses. All right, now you have the issues. I can't read that. You can't but, even tell what state it's from. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. and then three houses is not gonna happen. But I can see trillions of miles away, and I can see back in time, literally back in time. <laughs> so, no, absolutely not. I mean, <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if I can see, if I can see trillions of miles out, out in space, it should work the same way laterally, all right? I should be able to see all kinds of stuff, but I can't. I, I mean, I should at least be able to, to, to see a license plate down there, but I can't, at least. Now, you, you're not gonna, the human eye cannot resolve past the convergence points of perspective. So, so when, when perspective converges to a point, it doesn't matter what lens you have, it doesn't matter what it is, you're not going to be able to resolve an image beyond the converging point of, of perspective. But before that, I should be able to see all kinds of stuff. All right? Um, so they're going to have to prove that. Yeah, they haven't. Yes. We got, a, we got a question for oh, you from okay. a viewer. Um, mm -hmm. This is from Gigi. It seems to me that the stars and planets are getting larger or getting closer. It reminds me of where the Bible says that they will eventually all fall to earth. Has Michael photographed them at different times and noticed a change that might reflect that? She noticed that the Big Dipper constellation in particular seems much bigger. Hmm. No, I don't photograph it enough to, to notice a change. That's a doggone good experiment though. Mm -hmm. um, where I live, I live in a much better place because I used to live in an inner inner city and now I live in like an inner outer city. <laughs> and so I can see much more stars. But Take on the World, I've never seen the rift before until Take on the World. I'm like, whoa. Do you, you, know? you have that star? Is it possible to pull up that? Uh, yeah. Just a little snippet of that video? Yeah. Just to show people? Um, that one was very exciting. And, and uh, let's see. Um, oh, yeah, I know where it is. <clears throat> 
You don't have the internet, do you? Like, it's not connected. I don't know, actually. Uh, no, I already, I already saw that. Here, that thing. If not, you can go to the Flat Out Insights YouTube channel, correct? It's on there, the star video. It's on Take, take on, on the World, world TV. Oh, Take on the World. Okay, yeah. go to Take on the World TV YouTube channel to view that video that Michael took. Yeah. He's oh, he's got it. Oh, Perfect. he's got it. Okay. And of course, it's bright now, so, but. Oh, oh. Look at that. I got to show you. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see if I can pull these up. Now, a lot of people say, this is blurry. Okay, here's the thing with blurry. Blurry means that sharp edges be, be, become spread out and they become soft. Do you see a soft edge in there anywhere? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it is what it is. I think a lot of people cannot accept the fact that stars do that. All right, now I was trying to stay as still as I could. I was like this, I was getting cramps in my legs. And <laughs> I was hold. I was literally holding. And this was with Daryl's P one thousand. No, no, that was with mine. That was that. was with mine. But you really have to have a very substantial tripod. And you see how it changes shape. It'll, it'll, yeah. Look at that. That's your picture. Oh, that's bizarre. Look at that. Um, also, some people say that you you don't even see the core in this, but they say because um, a lot of stars will have a core that doesn't change. Okay. And um, that's, that's and they say that's due to the diaphragm. The problem with that is when a star is moving around and doing and all like this fluctuating stuff, um, yeah, I like that. then no matter what, if there's no pixels within yeah. the center of the image, it's, it's not going to cover it up, is it? Yeah, okay? Because there's no hard. pixels there. Yet, like, no, this, this thing is all over the place. place. Sometimes you see the core, sometimes you don't. And look, it's going to change shape for your website. No. Oh. 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 Yeah. Look at that website. That is, look at that. What the heck is that? Look at that. Wow. Yeah. That is bizarre. I did not change folders or anything. there's no anybody. settings being changed. Mm -hmm. that. No, there's wow. no settings. I was just trying to stay still. Okay. <laughs> um, so there's no settings, no, no changing. So no, it's not blurry. It's just what's happening up there. You know? Very nice. Uh, so... Um, there's one other thing I want to say about it. This is a freeze frame of this. Oh, and someone has been, uh, someone took this shot and freeze framed different parts of different frames and found images in what's going on there. Now, the Bible says stars are angels. Yeah, so if, it, you, guys, right. if you can see, this is a, this is what it, um, somebody sent that from his video. Right. Of a freeze yeah. frame. Yeah, okay. and it's like there's a cross, like almost like a person too. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bizarre. Now, now oh, wow. some of the naysayers who say that the stars, flat earthers take blurry star images, and sometimes they're right. When you see a star that's totally like this, and there's like waves going through it and stuff like that, and it's really spread out, and it's almost a perfect yeah. circle, it's blurry. Okay, that's actually called bokeh. Oh, that's when you take lights, and you blur the lights and make colored circles of and you make circles of color with it. So when you achieve this image, you're actually taking a focused picture of the star. I'm taking a focused picture. The same focus I use on the moon, Jupiter, Saturn, I'm using on that. Right. And like you said, and we all know here, that the Bible says that the, the stars are angels. Yep. You know, and, and they're in prison and held there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do you see when you see that star dancing around the way it is? Yeah. What emotion comes to you? That would describe what you see that star doing. Crazy. <laughs> Chaotic rage. Yep. Yeah. Right? Yep. So they're like, it almost looks like right. they're trying to escape. They are yeah. trying to get out of there. Chaotic yeah. end. I mean, to put it in human perspective, think of the Vikings when they had their style of combat called Berserker or Berserker. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's yes. what that star is doing. <clears throat> yeah. He's, 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 he's struggling and striving against his imprisonment, which he can never ever achieve right. escape right. from. Right. Until. <laughs> Yeah, keep, important. yeah, and keep in mind that you've got the wandering stars, which is what we believe our modern science refers to as planets. Yes. But when you look at them, even with the naked eye or uh, through, you know, cameras and whatnot, I mean, the other ones are fixed, but it's, it's only the wandering stars that have movement. When we were filming with VR and Michael mm -hmm. down from our house after the class, we were, after a while, we had to adjust things because Jupiter 
was moving. Yeah. It was moving that direction away from us. And so we had to keep adjusting. Whereas there were some stars that when the clouds would cover up Jupiter, we we're like, okay, where's the next bright star? We would go focus back to this other same star that was right in that general direction, mm -hmm. and it wasn't moving at all. It stayed in the same position the entire two hours that we were filming, yet when we were trying to film Jupiter, it was obviously moving. So one of the things also, you know, you see stars flicker. Now I know why they flicker. They're going crazy up there. It's science will tell you it's because the atmosphere is moving across the star and it causes it to flicker. I disagree with that. I think it's flickering because your because your human eye sees it as a little dot of light, but it's moving it's, it's moving around and fluctuating so crazy in such a crazy way, it creates a flicker. You see it as a flicker, but then when you zoom in on it, you get that. Okay. It's I think, frequency. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Energy and frequency. Energy and frequency. Yep. I know it sounds new age. No. But <laughs> that. Well, it does if, if you see new age and what they talk about. The thing about the new age movement is okay. Now, no, really stepping on some toes. The thing about the new age movement is they actually have a lot of things wrong, but they usually get their conclude a lot of things right, but they usually get their conclusions wrong. Okay. So they their sources and where their um, um, knowledge is going usually goes in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And you also have frequently you have God the Father who created mm -hmm. and you have man trying to hijack something. Yep. So some of the stuff yep. that we see in the occult and other things, yep. some of the stuff that they're, you know, their base stuff that they're working with, they're actually mm -hmm. trying to hijack or um, yeah. counterfeit mm -hmm. what some principle that God actually did create himself. Yeah. We see that with Satan. He is often trying to counterfeit. He's trying to take credit for it. In fact, it. He can, that's all he can do. He because he create. cannot create. Right. No. He cannot speak something into existence as no. the Father can. Well, that's another thing, too. Yeah. Right? Well, you, you can even throw Newton in there because he coined gravity. The apple fell out of the tree because the force pulls it exactly. down. And in gravity. reality, it's just buoyancy and density because yes. the apple is yeah. more dense than the air the that air. surrounds it. Yes. And when right. it came free from the branch, it landed on the ground. And that's, the ground was more dense than the apple. Those are the principles of God's creation. Exactly. So, right. Yeah. right, right. Uh, science will actually <clears throat> use a legitimate phenomenon to explain an illegitimate theory. That's why when you see crepuscular rays, sunbeams, my personal favorite, when you see that, they say it's perspective. Perspective is real, the light rays are real, but they never match. Perspective has nothing to do with light beams, literally nothing. And that is so easy to prove. Um, so they do that a lot. But people just say, oh, these scientists, they know. And we are finding out they don't know a lot. <laughs> Unless they're engineers or something, or someone who actually used the technology and the science and the phenomena on a daily basis. Those are the people I like listening well, to. Well, some of the top scientists, Michio Kaku says that they are 10 to the 120th power off. You know, they're off by that factor. Uh, yeah, saying, and they and actually Neil deGrasse Tyson said we're 94% stupid. But believe us. But science, mm -hmm. he's saying science is 94% stupid. Wow, but we're still supposed to believe it yeah. and take their word, take for, our it, word for it. Which is ridiculous. Oh, um, you guys are going to make your reservation for the, for the hotel in um, um, 2025, I think? 2025? Oh, you, uh, you didn't hear about it? Yeah, Space Hotel. <laughs> the space it's going to yeah. happen in 2025. Yeah. I just saw that this morning. That was a hoot. Okay. Space, space Force will be working security at the hotel. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, the interesting thing about it is. Are they going to, first of all, are they going to carry the hoax all the way to, to the end where they actually have a hotel? And, and the next question is, how are they going to fake it? Because they've been able to fake the ISS to, to people for, what, 20 years now? Yeah. 20? So, so can they do it? Yes, but faking a hotel in space is going to take a lot more work, mm -hmm. okay? Because faking the actual hotel, that's easy. But getting from here to there, that's the hard part. How can you fake that, okay? Um, because with a hotel, you have to have people that don't know what's going on, that think they're in a hotel. Um, remember that show, did anyone see that show? It was in England, and, and these people, these, they, it was a reality show, and they faked space, and these people went up in the space station, they thought they were in a space station, <laughs> for, for real. And, and they successfully <coughs> faked space for people that don't have a clue. Not astronauts, not people wearing a mason ring or anything like that. They were just normal people. Well, that's what they got to do in order to 
Well, like my brother, he went. To they the have to. Yeah. They have to. And it's not that hard, but they're going to have to go from here to there. Um, that's the hard part. <coughs> They'll probably knock on your windows. Oh, we, you know, we want to be safety conscious right. or whatever. Because <laughs> if you shoot a window, if they have a, a, a video of the clouds going by and then, and then the sky gets darker and then you go in, up into space, if that's a video, when you shoot that and you zoom in on it, you're going to see the scan lines of the video so you know it's a video so they can't do that. Mm -hmm. but they did yeah. something similar in that movie, Now You See Me, where they faked the people traveling in a plane. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, okay, okay. And you've been in amusement parks and stuff where you're, uh, you're going to a sub and they have video screens in the windows and mm -hmm. make you look like you're going underwater and stuff. Yeah. It, it's possible, <coughs> but I mean, is it worth it? Probably because we're giving them headaches. So they're going to have to do something drastic. They're going to have to get more people up in space because they should have been there already. So now they're going to have to fix that. So I saw that today. <laughs> that was fun. Any other questions or anything? Any last questions? I, I we're going to take a quick, a quick break question. here in a moment. Mm -hmm. the, the smaller bridge camera that you've only picked up to make fun of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, only because I have one of those also. Is that okay. even worth investing in at this point? This? Yes. The lens is too short. It's okay. only a 6X. This is a, what is that, 87X? 83. 83X. You know. Well, I just, like I said, I know it's the older technology, but I, that I have. Yeah. This I just bought. I still wish for one of those. <laughs> yeah, I love the I love the grip on this. It's a really nice grip. This is my first digital camera. And so can you get some decent pictures with that? Yes. The processor on this one is bigger though. Okay. Um, and the lens on this one is bigger. This is a Fujinon lens. Fuji makes good lenses. This lens is better. My, mine actually is a Fuji, but yep. that, that is not worth investing into. No. Learning how no, to do it. That's what I'm no. getting. Now, here's the interesting con part. Continue All, with this. You would continue with that. Okay. All the controls mm -hmm. here, I mean here, here, and here are here. Right. Yeah, they're all that. there, you know. Um, but um, this is a better camera. That is a better camera than this. Um, and you can get, although this one has a hot shoe in it, which is really interesting. And this does not. That was almost a deal breaker for, for Maria and I because... Uh, this doesn't have a hot shoe because without a hot shoe, you can't do this and other types of accessories. That's the why the 1000 has the 1000 has a hot shoe and the 1000 shoots raw. When I get my 1000, I'm going to compare the two, and you'll see there's huge comparison. I mean, huge difference. Um, but a hot shoe just changes everything. Uh, you can do so much more with it. Also, in the flat, in the flat Earth community, when you're talking about 200 millimeter, that's like chump change, man. What, what, what are you going to do with that? That's, you know, the, I need a good lens. Right, right. In the, in, in the flat earth community, you're, you, you're, you're using focal lens 1200 and up. Okay? This is completely useless. Um, so it's pretty interesting. <clears throat> All right. Michael, thank you very much. Yeah. We're going to take a five to seven minute break. And then we're going to let Chris and Liz share a few things about the wrap up from Take On The World 19. And then I'll have a few last minute things and we may end just a little bit before four. Anybody that uh, wants to go with us uh, to dinner will share some info about that. So thank you very much and we'll be back. Hey, you're back. <laughs> Yeah. 